Well, how are you, Streakers? Hopefully doing fantastic. Jamie and I are excited today because we have someone very special on the show. Our guest is an international expert in dramatically improving the performance and profitability of organizations. His two degrees, international study of organizational execution on site in more than two dozen countries and multiple combat deployments as a Marine Corps war correspondent, prepared him for, and I love this phrase, the battlefield of business. He is a Tampa-based TEDx speaker. His work uh, studying teams in more than two dozen countries, some more dangerous, some of the more dangerous places on the planet, has been published in news outlets including Time, CNN, NBC, Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and Inc. His clients have included Deloitte, ConAgra, Coca-Cola, and dozens of similar businesses. Sean... Now I've given you his first name. Our guest is also a nationally syndicated columnist with the business journals and author of the books Pivot Point, Turn on a Dime Without Sacrificing Results, and Universal Export, a guide for overachievers in working less and enjoying more. He also has published Bulletproof Selling. Sean regularly shares the latest sales systems each week through interviews with top sales leader in his Bulletproof Selling podcast, and we'll learn a little bit more about that later. But we'd like to welcome to the show, without hesitation and with great gratitude, Mr. Sean Rhodes, and let's start streaking. Sean, we're so excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much. A pleasure to be here. Um, this is uh, it's, it's a little atypical for me. Most of the time I'm on shows that are just about sales. So I'm super excited to talk about just systems in general, as it's something that I've, I've found a lot of success with and helped me maintain sanity with as well. That's so awesome. It was fun because when we started, just before we started recording, you you were great because you said, where do you want me to go? I can go with my selling, bulletproof selling. I can go with my military background. I can go with systems. And as I was listening, I thought, wow, we need more podcasts because I want to go all of those places. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's start just a little bit with you telling us kind of what you got, kind of a little bit of your past life and what got you started on and in, in where you are right now. Absolutely. So I was raised in the mountains of North Carolina, uh, moonshiners, banjo pickers, some of the best places and people in the world. And I joined the Marine Corps right out of high school. Now, the reason I oh, joined really? the Marine Corps, I, I was the last person anyone thought would be a Marine. They actually had a, a pool going for what week they thought I was going to drop out of boot camp. I was really? like, overweight, no <laughs> discipline, hated systems, despised authority. And um, a couple of those things haven't changed. Some of them have. Uh, but the the passion <laughs> I had in my life was, and this this really goes to like more of a, a lifelong uh, goal journey that I didn't want to wake up at 80 and realize that I had wasted the opportunity that I'd been given in this life. There's mm -hmm. a, a couple of religious stories that, that I'll point back to someone ending up in heaven and they were afraid they'd be asked, why weren't you like Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad or you know, any of the great religious figures? And uh, the, the folks up there, they say, well, we're really more interested in why you weren't like the best Jeff that you could be or the best Jamie that you could be. Yeah. Um, and that's really that, that, that stuck right. with me. So I've tried to take advantage of every opportunity my life has presented to me. And the first one was, hey, you know, instead of just learning about history, how would you like to participate in making history? That's the the sales oh. pitch the Marine Corps gave me. And I said, that that's right on line with my mission. Let's do it. <laughs> Not knowing about a lot else to do with the military. Like I said, I wasn't a military guy, <laughs> uh, but they sent me around the world. I had the very unique job of studying what the very best teams in the world were doing. So I got to train alongside Marines, Navy SEALs, Green Berets, all kinds of great people. And when they did something that others thought was impossible, they wanted to, one, publicize it, but also to figure out how do we make sure that everybody knows about this so that if we right. chanced upon something that kept us alive, we didn't leave it to chance. The next team would figure that out as well. Or if we, we made a mistake that almost got people hurt, well, how do we make sure that mistake never gets made again? So my work mm. on the battlefield was to study those things. Now, fast forward a few years, I'm, I'm starting my own business, not knowing anything about business or sales and failing miserably, as many of us do with our first couple of uh, chances to, to start a business. And I thought to myself, well, I'm going to run out of money soon. But in my, my last ditch effort, because I was doing everything, just like a lot of business people do, throwing it all at the wall, seeing what stuck. And when, when revenue would appear, I had no way to track it back to say, well, I, I just need to repeat these things to get more of that. 
because I'm trying a thousand things. I don't know what of a thousand things is actually producing results. <laughs> so I was able to find out, all right, let's, let's build a system here. Let's build a simple system so that I know at least I did these five things. And if they produce revenue, awesome. And if they don't, well, then I know to, to alter something. Let's, let, let's iterate it. Let's make it better. And now 10 years into my own business, I've been able to speak to 30,000 audience members, uh, multiple countries wow. around the world, Fortune 100 clients. Uh, so it's, it's helping me fulfill my mission that I had at a very early age of not wasting the opportunity that I've had. Now, systems are a massive part of that. Uh, keeping focused on my priorities each day is a big part of that. And taking the things that the military taught me that were useful and also putting down the things or trying to put down the things that might work on an actual battlefield, but don't work too well in business. So that's a little <laughs> bit about me and my life journey. And I'm happy to go from here. <laughs> yeah. So let I want to unpack just a little bit of this. There's so much yeah. neat things that you have there. When you made the decision in high school to go to the Marine Corps, that something had to trigger there because if you said they were taking bets on yeah. if you would make it through boot camp, there th that was a massive change in your life. Just walk us through a little bit of that. So at uh, 17, that's how old I was when I joined, so young that my mother had to sign for me. And I have a four-year-old yes. daughter now. And uh, if, if she ever puts that decision forward to her mother, there's going to be a lot more uh, consternation <laughs> in this house, I can tell you that. Uh, but the, yeah. the idea behind it was I needed to prove something to myself. I needed to prove that no matter what the world threw at me, that I would figure out a way through it. And what the Marine Corps gave me was a very clear belief that once I set my mind to accomplish something, one of two things is going to happen. I'll either succeed eventually or I'll die trying because that's the mentality <laughs> that you have to have to succeed in combat. Um, and yeah. they, they gave it to me and I definitely took that forward. So through a lot of uh, rejection, I've, I've participated more than 30,000 sales calls. Not all of them resulted in business. So I got rejected a lot. Uh, it's all taught yeah. me that I can learn from any failure that happens in my life and get better from it. So at 17, um, I, I was you know faced with a couple of choices like a lot of 17 year olds are. I could go to college. That's a pretty common path. I knew though that if I went, I was going to end up wasting a lot of money, probably doing a lot of recreational substances that wouldn't be good for me long term. <laughs> and uh, that, that it was, was good was that you not... had that self awareness. Yeah, I, I mean, that type that. of self awareness yeah, is good. <laughs> I knew, uh, but yeah, if, if I ended up doing that, you know, that would probably not work out in my favor. I had a very clear vision of that. My other choice, uh, because I've always been interested in spirituality and philosophy, um, I had the choice to kind of wander the country like uh, Kwai Chang Kane and Kung Fu. Remember the old David Carradine series? So that was also yes. <laughs> I love it. But that, that, that would not come with three Got square meals offer. a day. Um, the, the other option was, of course, uh, you know, figure out what kind of organization I could join that would give me the life skills that I didn't have and, and that it would take me a long time to develop on my own. And I looked at all of the different military branches we have in here in the United States, and they all have a very different culture. So they've developed different marketing pitches to get people to join. And the Air Force is all about think smarter, not harder. And that's definitely great for, for a group of people. Uh, the Navy is all about travel, get to see the world and be on the water. And that's awesome, too. Army is about all of the benefits that you can get. The Marine Corps were the only ones that took a look at me and said, this probably isn't for you. Go somewhere else. <laughs> I Maybe I should it. try one of the other branches. <laughs> yeah, right. But for, 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 for someone whose mission is to prove themselves, I'm like, oh, you know, you, you just dropped the gauntlet. Challenge accepted. They said, are, are you sure about right. this? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Are you really sure, though? Are, are you absolutely sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Let's do it. And so that, that forced me to get into shape, drop 30 pounds before boot camp. And uh, when I was wow. finally in the Marine Corps, it's, it's a mentality that they, they give you. Or, and they train in you if you already have a little bit of it. Uh, but the idea that there's nothing that the world can throw at you that you can't succeed in. And that's really helped wow. me out as a business person as well. Um, and of course, yeah. a lot of yeah. what I do today with sales teams and in organizations is to bring the systems that the military uses to find success into the structure of a sales team or into the structure of, of an operational improvement plan. Uh, because we have an incredible way of uh, improving after every iteration, after every mission. And that allows us to stay current, up to date, to keep ourselves alive. 
And we found that a lot of salespeople and a lot of business people in general, they rely on hope probably more than they should, hoping things work out, <laughs> hoping this next sales call pans out. And we've tried to remove hope everywhere that we can in the military. And that's what I help organizations do today. Yeah. I was reading a little bit about that in uh, Bulletproof Selling about uh, it was the trimming. Was it trimming the hope? Is that yeah. is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk a little okay. bit about that in a minute. Um, curious. Yeah. Did you have a thought? I was just going to ask. So you may, listening, you probably are making people be like, well, I want to join the military. I want to be a Marine. <laughs> How can it, you? Do it. <laughs> but I'm looking at my life going, yeah, I think that ship sailed. So probably not going to be yeah, doing yeah. that. What are some things that people can do that you that you brought from the Marines that's like, look, everybody's not going to be able to join the Marines, but what can what are some things that you would recommend that people could do that you say you can have this kind of mindset even if you yeah. didn't go through the training to be a Marine? A hundred percent. And this is something that I, I carry with me as a civilian today, and it's the idea of being mission focused. Now, in sales, okay. a lot of salespeople are focused on their mission, their goals. I've got to make so many calls, make so many sales to earn so much commission. But the best salespeople are the ones that are not focused on their mission. They're focused on the mission of the people around them, focused on the mission of their team, their prospects. So when I'm making calls today, sales calls, I want to learn as much as I can about the people that I'm wanting to do business with to learn about their goals and their challenges so that I can be the bridge to help them reach those things faster, better, more efficiently. And we find that's a much better way to sell because otherwise it's you're just basically a commodity provider. I'm selling a widget. There are other people selling you widgets. So we're all competing on price. Um, now, as an individual, whether you're in business or not, how do you be more mission focused? Figure out what your mission is in life. Uh, mine, of course, as I mentioned before, was to not wake up at 80 and realize I'd missed opportunities that would allow me to fully actualize the talents, the skills that I've been provided. For you, your mission may be uh, to take care of your family, to raise uh, children that are going to be productive members of society. Uh, your mission might be to grow a business. It might be to make a positive impact in your community or with a nonprofit that you're passionate about. And all that you do 40 hours a week to earn a living just flows right into that. Just be mission yeah. focused. And what that allows you to then understand is to have a clear lane to operate in. So um, I was provided an opportunity yesterday. Someone wanted to pay me thousands of dollars to speak at, at an event they were hosting. And they said, Sean, we, we need you to speak on these time management topics exactly like another speaker does it. And I could take a clear look at that and say, that's not on my mission. Um, if you, yeah. You're welcome to hire that other speaker if you can afford them. You know, they're real big. They probably don't have a budget for it. But it's like, I would be unethical. I would be off mission if I accepted that offer, no matter how much you paid me. Yeah. Uh, because it, it doesn't... Yeah help me fulfill what I know I'm here on earth to do. So to answer your question, it's really about defining for yourself, what does success look like in 20, 30, 40 years? And it may not be to have eight beach houses and, and a Bentley in the garage. It may be something more simple, like to have kids that you love spending time with, that you have a relationship with. So many people don't, uh, maybe to have a paid off house. I mean, just figure out what that is for you. And that'll allow you to very clearly make decisions to keep you mission focused. Yeah. As you, you know, as you articulate that and, and as you talk about it, I'm thinking about in the Marine Corps, were there, were there a couple of different experiences that really helped you to get to that point where, you know what, I need to be mission focused. I mean, there was the decision obviously to go into the military, but then there's probably a couple of experiences with how long you were in the Marine Corps and everything else that helped you down that path. What yeah. were those? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll give you an, an insight into staying mission focused. And it came to me after a couple of weeks of nonstop combat outside the city of Fallujah in 2004. Uh, we were responsible for kicking down doors, clearing city block after city block, very dangerous wow. work. Something like a 50% yeah. casualty rate is what we expect out of that. And wow. they finally, after, you know, we're all burned out, we haven't had a lot of food, water supplies are, are low. Uh, they said, listen, we're going to pull you back to our forward operating base, replace you with another unit on the front line. You get a couple of days to recharge, rest, you know, uh, clean yourselves because there's no showers when you're in combat operations. So basically take care of yourself. So we get back to the forward yeah. operating base. And I realized that while we've been gone, pallets and pallets of books have been delivered to this forward operating base. Just think like you go into a Sam's Club or a Costco, and I'm sure you all have those where you're at, just pallets and pallets of books. And they're all in English. They're all apparently postmarked from U.S. libraries. 
So I ask our supply folks to, you know, handle the airlift of this stuff into the forward operating base. Why are these books here? What are they for? And they explained that libraries in the U.S. got the word. No one had anything to read in Iraq except books about Saddam and the Ba'ath Party. It's all political propaganda. And so they said, hey, if you have anything to donate to the, the people of Iraq, here, here's a way to do it. Well, there were two problems immediately with this plan. First one was that they were all in English. Not very many Iraqis can read English. So maybe it was a way for them to learn. I don't know. Second problem, uh, they were mostly romantic fiction. Now, oh. I, don't, I, I don't know if you're That's a fan That's what gets donated, book. huh? <laughs> exactly. Yes, uh, Jamie. I don't know if you're a fan, but you like, you know, the books of these, these have on, like Fabio shirtless, you know, with like the damn face, <laughs> yeah. so you, you know, like pouring out of her outfit. Waving hair. Exactly. Waving hair. Like this was not going to play well in a conservative Muslim culture. Uh, so the, the plan was just not thought through. However, yeah. in the stack of books, there was one personal development book amidst thousands. There's some, they, they said like snuck in somehow. And it was The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Uh, you know, I think yeah. 18 years later, I'm, I'm looking at this book on my bookshelf. I kept it. And the, the, one of the main habits in that book was that we cannot control what happens to us, but we can always control how we respond. This is a very basic system. And folks like uh, Eli Weissel, who survived um, torture in the concentration camps during World War II, he came up with a very similar conclusion as well in his book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. So yeah. that really helped me survive in combat because I couldn't control being in combat. I couldn't control the things that were happening to me and the friends around me. But I realized I always had the ability to respond from a, a place inside of me, from my choice. I could think this is miserable or I can think this is an opportunity. And if I could do that in combat, then it would be very easy for me to do that anywhere else in life. Because I've here in the United States again for 18 years back home, uh, haven't been shot at once. No one's tried to blow me up. You know, the worst I've ever faced is don't ever call me again. That's about as rude as people get, yeah. in my life, <laughs> uh, which is fine. I'm happy to hear it. So uh, I'd, I'd say, you know, the, the one thing that really helped me be mission focused was understanding that lesson that no matter what happens in life, we always have the ability to choose how we respond. And that's a lesson that I feel like we could all benefit from given what's going on today, no matter what side of the aisle you sit on politically, where you're at uh, geography wise in the North and the South, it doesn't matter. Uh, being able to choose how we respond and be conscious of that and not just get triggered based on what's happening around us. Right. I think that's a vital thing that will help us all be more successful. That you that were able so to find good. that book among the thousands of books. You got you to gotta believe there's divine, divine providence out there. there. I <laughs> yeah. do believe there's divine intervention in that case. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's so great. And I love that in within that divine intervention, because this is a lot of my belief, is that I mm -hmm. love that the intervention wasn't pulling you out of the scenario, but giving you tools to be able to handle it better, to, to, to change, to recognize, look, I don't have control over all of my circumstances, but I do have more control than what I'm recognizing. And I can practice to be better at using that control and making those choices better. I feel like that's so huge when we talk about divine intervention, because I think sometimes we want the circumstance to be changed, but so often the intervention is here, I'm going to teach you how to handle it better. And, and really, yeah. that's more long lasting and, mm -hmm. and much more just better for us. Mm -hmm. a, a great so. way I've, I've heard that phrased is that um, God or the divine is not going to change the circumstance, but it will give you a way to change yourself to better fit yep. the circumstance. And that's something yeah. I remember because there's so many things in my life every day that don't go exactly how I plan. Um, but right. I have the opportunity in each of those cases to then figure out, all right, well, how do I change what's going on within me to reset, to refocus, to change the lens that I'm seeing this through to realize, well, what I thought was a failure might actually be a blessing. And how do I see I that? Because I, I don't have that 360 degree do, uh, view. I, I don't think any of us does uh, that we can see mm -hmm. all the plan that's happening around us. Uh, so I've got to trust. And that's a massive piece of becoming a fully actualized human, in my opinion, trusting in whatever you believe in, that uh, you're only seeing a small portion of it. That's where the the book that you uh, you mentioned, um, Universal Export, uh, which is really just yeah. about enjoying our work more, even if we're overachievers like me. So I, that, that was, that's who that book was written <laughs> for. Yeah. That's, that's great. That's awesome. So you're, so you're in the Marine Corps, you have this pivotal moment and experience, and there comes a point where, okay, I either continue with my Marine career and continue to get promotions or I decide I've got to, I'm going to go ahead and retire from military life and be civilian life. 
Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that decision and how you decided to to go civilian or whichever. I mean, yeah. civilian, obviously, where you are Absolutely. now. But tell us a little bit about that decision. Yeah, so I had um, gone into the Marine Corps with a very clear vision of what I wanted to get out of that experience, which is not something I found a lot of 17-year-olds even take the time to look at. Um, and it might be because they're just still figuring out their way in the world. And I'm still figuring out my way in the world. I'm turning 40 in a couple of months. Um, still hasn't happened completely yet. But I, I knew that I wanted to get some life skills. I wanted to um, get some self-dependence uh, to know that I could succeed. I could make a plan and execute on it, that I could learn some discipline, things I didn't have before the military. And so at about my year and a half, two year point, I realized I probably don't want to make this a 20 year career because I'd already been deployed okay. to combat twice. I'd spent, you know, probably more than a year of my life, uh, which I, I'm trying to think of the, the about 10 percent of my time on Earth. Uh, by the time I yeah. had reached 21 had been spent in combat. I'm like, that's pretty good. I feel like I checked that box. That, yeah, yeah, I think you're good. Thank you for your <laughs> yeah, service. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. And so um, I was I was actually the the military is big on people pursuing education while they're in the military because the government pays for it. So why not? And um, I, I realized, well, I need to get registered for college. I didn't want to float around for two or three years like a lot of veterans do trying to figure out their path. I wanted to go from the military into university. I promised my mother that I would go to college as soon as I left the Marine Corps. That was her vision for me to, to be a college graduate. And so while I was in Iraq, I was actually submitting college applications um, you know, from our forward mm -hmm. operating base and having to you know, conduct um, um, interviews on the phone. I'd have to stay up till about 3 a.m. Iraqi time because they're on the opposite side of the world. And, you know, these, these people at these universities would say, Sean, the connection is, is horrible there. I say, oh, don't worry about that. It's just incoming fire. Uh, just, 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 just keep talking. We're okay. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Don't, yeah, don't, right. don't mind the bombs in the background. Yeah, We're good. Mind, Let's stay focused right shots. here on this. Yeah, right here, right here. Let's talk about your college. Yeah. Um, so I knew I wanted to go to university and... That was a pretty quick transition for me. I think it was less than six months from being in combat to being in a college classroom, uh, which is where a lot oh, of veterans wow. found themselves up until very recently. You know, when we, we spun down uh, Afghanistan and got out of there, a lot of veterans were just going straight from military to college. And it was interesting to be 22, had gone to dozens of countries and to be surrounded by people that had not been out of their hometown, but who were only yeah. you know, three or four years younger than me. So it's a mindset shift. I had a, a level of maturity that they didn't have just through life experience. Um, but there were yeah. a lot of things that they were smarter at than I was, like listening to our bodies. You know, mm -hmm. like the Marine Corps teaches you how to shut it down because you, you're, you're trained to work through pain. Well, these folks, if they right. were in pain, they'd be like, I need to go to the doctor. And I, you know, I'd sit there like I've got a sucking chest wound. Let's figure out how to plug it so I can continue on. <laughs> That's just the, the mentality that they give you. Um, so I've, I've had to unlearn some things in the military through the last couple of years as well. But the uh, the idea of transitioning back into society now, um, and I've, I've done a lot of veteran transition counseling, spoken at a lot of universities where they take all the veterans, put them together in a room, and say, you know, how do we transition to be more successful in a civilian environment? It's to understand that they train us to an extremely high level, which makes us very valuable to a civilian employer. But we also have to operate in a team that is not as mission focused. Um, mm. Most people in, in either entrepreneurial life or in a corporate life, they're focused on their paycheck, making sure that they have time off work at the end of the day, that they're with their families. And that's just not something the military is concerned with as a priority. So it's been a lot of yeah. learning and unlearning throughout the last couple of years. How do we operate in a way that allows us to still make an impact, uh, but also earn an income and make sure we're part of a team that we're all raising each other together rather than, you know, well, if you're just going to you know, be lazy in my judgment, then I'm just going to blow past you. That doesn't work well in the team. Uh, so I've had to learn that right. as well. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like there's stories behind that. Oh, I love plenty, plenty, plenty. <laughs> <laughs> I love as you're talking what I'm what I'm visualizing and what I'm hearing is you said I had to unlearn things. Mm -hmm. I kind of look at it that you learned things but then also had to recognize what I learned worked really well in the military because there were a certain set of expectations and a certain set of boundaries and parameters that everyone was mm -hmm. living by. But then when I tried to function in that same way in a different environment where those boundaries are different or those expectations are different, it wasn't working as well. But yeah. I love that you were able to recognize 
that, that there's this process of learning and growth through all of it, that, that you look at it and say, okay, I had this basic foundation and these are the things that worked. And not that the principle is wrong, but in this particular instance and in this environment, it's not working as well. And I need to figure out why and, and make that adaptation. Because I think that's a huge part of being able to learn to work with all different kinds of people and different circumstances, which is what I hear you saying. In the military, there's a certain set and expectation that everybody's living by, and but not in life, not outside no. of the military. It's not the same. And oh, 100%. So. Yeah. And, and you'd asked earlier, what are some things that I, I carried over that were useful from the military? And this is this is definitely one of them that's helped me accomplish what you just said, which is, you know, work with a group of people that have a different background. We're not all coming from right. the same culture. Um, and that's to live out of priorities. So this is something that became very clear to me as a business owner. And at the end of the day, if I didn't close, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in business, then I would judge myself as a failure because my job is to, mm -hmm. you know, make money, provide uh, uh, an impact in, on audiences and in, in organizations. But if I didn't make the sale, then, well, by definition, I've failed. If, if my only measure of success is, did I close business? And so what I began to realize is, what am I actually here to achieve? And again, back to that, you know, I don't want to wake up at 80 and realize I've wasted opportunity. So I realized I would rather be known as a good father, a good husband, a good member of my community than a good businessman. Good businessman would be excellent, but if I had to choose, because I, you know, if, if everything's a priority, nothing is, that's an old saying. And so what I do now right. is each, each day at the beginning of the day, I examine what are my life priorities. And I, this is a great exercise for anybody to be able to do if they want to maximize what's inside of them, uh, because it allows us to then know at the end of the day, did I accomplish the things that are most important to me? Given the fact that I can't control what anybody else does. Again, I can only control how I respond. So my life priorities, you know, I'll just give you an example list. This is just for Sean here. And my first one is my spirituality. So my connection with God, the divine, all that fun stuff. My second one is physical mm -hmm. health. My third one is my family. My fourth one is my friends and my community. And my fifth one is my business in that order. So what I make sure okay. I do is I live out of that. So basically, if, if, if those are my five priorities, um, I want somebody to be able to say, well, Sean, let's look at how you spent your time and see if we can convict you from living out of those priorities, <laughs> right? And so at, in the morning, first thing when I'm up, I'm meditating, I'm praying, I'm journaling. Second thing I do is I exercise. Third thing is then I'm hopping into family and helping them get ready for the day. And they're off to school and off to work and all that fun stuff. And so now I can check in with my friends. Is there anybody that needs me right now? Is there anybody I can be of value to, to reconnect with? And then whatever time is left over is what, I, what my business gets. So my business is the last thing on my list because it's not my top priority. For some of us, business is first priority for a variety of reasons. That's fine. Uh, but what this allows me to do, Jamie, at the end of the day, to be able to say, if I accomplish my spirituality today, I fulfilled that priority and everything else didn't happen, am I a success? And I can judge myself as a success. I took care of my primary priority, my number one priority. And if I got my workout in after that, well, now I've just, I've just won the day. Nothing, you know, if, if, if nothing else yeah. goes right, that's a win. And if I got to spend time with my family, that's a ooh, win. now, now I'm flying, I'm flying today. I got 110% on this test. And it just operates like that for me out of my day. And the military taught me how to do that, but I had to adapt it a little bit to the civilian life just to know that even though I can't control what happens around me, who I do business with today, who signs a check that I can still be a successful human being. Cause I decided I'd rather be that than anything else. Yeah. So uh, curious, you've mentioned your family a couple of times and uh, along the way somewhere you got married and you had children. Uh, yep. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Oh, this is going to be a fun story. Um, so my wife is actually the family babysitter. Really? Really? And I get that look every time I tell the story. All right. So here's, here's the, here's the backstory to that. Um, okay. She, yes. my, my wife is younger than me. Uh, she was my cousin's babysitter live in babysitter for for their kids and that's how we met so okay. i was visiting my cousin one day uh they have little toddlers running around at the time and so that's how my wife and i met but i love telling the story she's a family babysitter because it's true that's so <laughs> great so, people don't know what to say next yeah. oh, no they okay. don't, okay. They don't. <laughs> uh, yeah we, we got married uh in 2013 um had our daughter in 2018 
And she's four years old now, reading on her own, smart as a whip. Um, she's vastly smarter than I was at that age, which just tells me she's going to be smarter than I ever was, uh, which is awesome. Um, and yeah, we live here That's in Tampa, great. Florida, one of the uh, greatest states in the nation, in my opinion. And the weather is absolutely gorgeous. Can't ask for better weather. I know. Uh, don't, oh, yeah. don't rub it in. <laughs> so as you as you talk about priority systems and everything else, mm -hmm. how did you and your wife, you know, merge together? Because I, I've, you know, there's there's stories of when a military man goes into a family, it runs like the military. And After I'm that. sure that you guys have had <laughs> some discussion about some, that. Some discussion yeah. about that. How how have you guys formed your family life? I mean it and and work together to form that family life. Absolutely. So in, in the early days it was definitely uh, a feeling out of boundaries, as all relationships tend to be, especially as they get serious. Um, we have to each decide what are the things that we're not willing to tolerate and hopefully communicate those things to our partners. And my wife did a great job of doing that for me. She's a very strong-willed woman. I don't think I would be comfortable with any, any, anything less than that. And so <laughs> as, as, we, as we brought our family together you know, and began thinking, all right, well, this is gonna be long-term. What does that look like? Um, it really came down to open communication, being willing to say, um, you know, this, this hit me in this way, what, what you just said or what, what happened just now, here's how it affected me, um, to use a lot of eye-centered language. And then to understand that above all else, we're a team together. And so uh, that came down to combining finances to operate off the same page out of our household budget, uh, to be a united front as parents so that our daughter never has a dream that she can go to one of us and get a different answer than she would get from the other one, uh, to be uh, willing to communicate at night to catch up on the day. You know, how did that, how did that go? You know, how was your day? Uh, we have a, a ritual around our family dinner table, which we sit down and eat dinner as a family every night without the TV, uh, which great. is, you know, kind of rare these days. Uh, but we have a, we yeah. have a ritual where we ask, what's your favorite part of the day? And our, our four-year-old daughter can talk about her favorite part of school. I can bring up something that happened in my life that was my favorite part. And my wife can do the same. Um, and often those things are just, you know, moments that we got to share together. Sometimes they happen when we're apart and that, that's all, that's all good. Uh, but that's something I felt like I learned from the military for sure, because the best units operated like that. They had open communication. Uh, there's an appropriate yeah. time and an inappropriate time to, to freely communicate. That's for sure. We don't want to, my wife and I don't want to have a spat in front of our child. That doesn't really show a united front mm -hmm. as parents. Um, but the fact that we can come together and be a team, uh, that lets me have a little bit more faith that whatever life does throw at us, that we will be able to, to overcome and, and achieve what we're after here, which is for my wife and I just to, uh, to be happy. I think it's, it's such an amorphous term, what does happiness look like? And it's going to be different for everybody. Uh, but the idea that we can be greater through coming together than we could be as individuals, that's about as close oh, as I yeah. can find it now. That's really That's neat. Really I love good. that. You can be closer coming together or you can be more coming together than you can as an individual. That's right. That's really fantastic. And just that feeling that that person has your back, that whatever yeah. you're going into, you're going in it together. Yeah. Which, which is tough for a military so, guy because I'm, I'm, I'm you know, the last person to ask for help. Uh, but my wife then has to step yeah. in like a, like a drill instructor and say, no, this is happening. You're going to do what you're told. This one time, do what you're told, Sean. All right, all right fine. Do it. Fine. Yeah. Okay. I this understand. one time. You know, there's a, there's a couple of things that you mentioned that I want to bring out for our streaking audience. Um, first of all, one of the things that you mentioned that we always promote as a streak to review your priorities every morning or every day. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. a great streak and one that can really significantly impact your life. We've interviewed several people that that is one of their streaks is they just, they are absolutely dedicated to, I'm going to do this every single day. And, and as you, and streakers, as you can hear here, Sean has done that and has prioritized his life in such a great way that there's many successes that follow behind that. It's, it's the success comes from the input it's not that accomplishment or the output that you're measuring. It's the inputs that you're measuring. Yeah. And, and I was thinking really, too, yeah, as ahead, you were, please. as yeah. you were talking, mm -hmm. sorry, just really quick. It's that yeah. it's the process of doing the process because you've mm -hmm. mentioned so many times that there was a lot of failure in that, but that the success was in the ability to keep going and overcoming the failure and, and in the way that you measured your success. In other words, you talked a lot about changing 
I was measuring my success by, am I getting the sales? And I had to look at life differently and think that's actually not the measure of success that I want. Mm -hmm. So I love that being able, because I think reviewing your priorities in the morning and then reminding yourself, this is what my measurement is, which I think we have to work really hard because the world is telling us differently. There's a lot of oh, people yeah. telling us that success is different and you have to really, really combat that to not have that drag you down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So looking out and seeing that the people that are trying to define my priorities for me, um, oh, I, 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 I just have to take a look at them and be like, all right, well, do I want your life? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I yes. really, really don't. Most of the people that are trying to define our priorities are uh, marketing executives. Um, they're running companies that profit by selling things. And that's not good or bad. It's just, yep. it is, it's a business model. Um, and so I ask myself, all right, well, if, if a person at, I don't know, um, Adidas, just pull a random brand out of the air or Pfizer or, or anywhere, right? You're, you're trying to tell me the choices that I should be making for my life. Great. I can take those, I can learn about them and I can make an educated decision and maybe our choices line up. What you're telling me to do is what I decide to do. Um, but if all I'm doing is watching TV or, or listening to the radio or listening to podcasts, as great as this one is, I bet you would still mm -hmm. say people need to make the decisions for themselves uh, to be able yes. to, oh, yeah. if these folks are getting on together every day, um, they're, they're tolerating each other enough to have these conversations together you two <laughs> every single day yeah. <laughs> that maybe there's something to learn there if that's an element of my life that i want you know that, that i want uh, to be able to get together with someone and say all right let's let's have a conversation with different people every day that's great so now right. that's an element that i want now i'm going to pay attention to what you guys have going on to the dynamic you have the questions you ask each other how you're giving each other time to voice concerns and listen and ask questions of the people that you're interviewing that's great so i think it's really important that we're a little more conscious about that and then and to your point, Jamie, about the, the way I define success, um, it's absolutely critical to set ourselves up for winning no matter what anybody else does around us. And for sales, for instance, let's take something that usually is very binary. We either made the sale or we didn't. If I don't make the sale, I have a system that I immediately put into play that asks the question, what happened? Hmm. And then why did that happen? And why did that happen? And then why did that happen? And we usually we get down to a pretty root level cause like, well, Sean, you didn't have uh, your, your questions in front of you that you needed to ask this person to qualify them as a buyer. Or maybe you're mm -hmm. a, a, a parent and something went wrong, you know, with between you and your kid, your kid yelled at you, stormed out the house. And that's a failure in your eyes because you want to be a good parent, have a good relationship. Let's ask what we could learn from that as a parent um, to be able yeah. to even if you know you're in the right to be able to ask, well, how could I do better? And if right. we approach life that way, then even a failure can become an opportunity to learn if you take what you learn and then make a change. And that's where yeah. systems come into play so heavily for me, because I could think of a thousand changes that I've learned to make over the years. But if I don't take those changes then and, and alter what I'm doing so that I get a different outcome, I haven't changed the equation at all. And, and that's really yeah. important for life, business, relationships to be able to think, all right, if, if A plus B equals C, and I learned that I really don't want C, I want E plus F. I have to change something in the beginning part of that equation in order to get a different outcome. And again, that yeah. all comes from us. What can we do to perceive differently, to act differently so that we can improve the world around us? You know, as, as I was listening to you, something that impressed me is you have some really great insights. And these insights don't come from just, you know, you have, to, in my mind, you have to spend some time really thinking about these. When, when do you spend that time? How do you spend that time to really evaluate and say, being intentional? One of the things that we really love about streaking and that we say it's simple and it's intentional. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're an individual that is intentional, it seems like at, at a lot of different levels, but you spend some real time thinking about each of these different areas. Tell us a little bit about that process and how you do that. So there's annual planning for my life and my business. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs will just do this for their business. And I'd encourage folks to do it with their lives as well. The most successful people that I know, and these are folks with uh, amazing relationships with their families. Um, they're very active in their faith communities, um, which 
ironically usually means that they're pretty wealthy as well like there, there's a weird correlation there that i haven't quite figured out <laughs> it's yet. really just strange <laughs> it's so strange uh but anyway um all of that comes together and these folks do, do this with their families so i try to model success right um so it's figuring out all right this year 2023 what do we want to do together as a family what are our big goals to set those out ahead of time uh, what are our financial goals? Where do we want to take some vacations? And even if they don't all come to pass, if some of them are outlandish, like we want to see, you know, we want to go on a worldwide cruise and spend eight months doing it. Maybe that's not going to happen this year, but you know, what could we do that we get us on the road? So to be able to do that personally, professionally, and that allows us then to look at quarterly, just like a business person would do. Um, am I on track or off track? And for yeah. individuals, you know, am I, am I more on track or off track to being a better partner or a better parent? great questions to ask ourselves and then allow it to, to readjust because a lot of us will go through a whole year and you know we we're binging you know shows on netflix and we're busy at work and we're running the kids to you know 18 different activities we don't really take the time to sit down and be like all right am i am i on track with my life right now um yeah. right. And, and being on track does mean that you're helping your family and facilitating those things it doesn't mean you stop doing those things but to ask the question am i doing what i want to do and then the daily activity then so we've taken kind of annual quarterly now we're going to go down to daily um, i spend time every single day i wake up before anyone else in my family does because i find it's the only time that i can get to myself which is you know just a hard learned lesson for a lot of parents out there uh, but i get it before anybody needs me and i stream of consciousness journal three pages and so this is a process oh really so you just, just write down whatever, whatever you're thinking write. yeah it's, it's, it's great self-therapy because usually I start that process with a question that I can't wrap my head around a solution for. Um, you know, what does success look like for me? Why am I struggling in this area? Why am I afraid of failure here? And the only rule to this process is, well, there's a couple of rules. One is you never have to reread what you wrote. You can destroy it immediately. And the second piece is you got to keep the pen moving until three pages are full. Oh, wow. And okay. as long as wow. you do that, this is, it's just like talking to a therapist where you don't have to ever worry about the therapist looking at you and, and you know, giving you like a look like, oh, you are messed up. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. No one's ever going to see this. Yep. You're going to need a right lot there. more <laughs> sessions with me. I was going to say, do they look at you like you're messed up or do they look at you like, wow, my next vacation Ooh, just yeah. walked in. This person's going to be coming back for a while. <laughs> Precisely. That's right. Yeah. So I, I just, I write for three pages every day. And I always find by the end of that process, even if I haven't solved the problem that that I brought to the session at the beginning, I'm at least clearer. I feel like there's a weight that's been lifted because I've been able to better define what's going on inside me. And that, because I then have cleared that, it allows me to be more focused and intentional in my day. Wow, that's great. That's really good. Um, as we wrap up with time here, we're getting close to the end. We want to end on the crescendo, which is you got into selling at some point yeah. <laughs> and you do a lot of sales work and everything else. What, when was, when was the decision to go fully down the sales route? How, and, and what made you go down that route? So I had been um, hired a lot when I opened my own business as an operational improvement consultant. So speaking on change mm -hmm. management, doing a lot of keynote talks around the world. And I discovered that when I went into an organization that hired me, they said, Sean, we, we need efficiency. We need improvement. We want you to start with our sales team. I said, why is that? These <laughs> folks aren't working on a factory line. You know, they're not in a warehouse. Uh, why do we want to start with sales? I said, we can make our bottom line as efficient as possible. But if we don't have top line revenue coming in our business, we're not making sales. It doesn't matter how much we improve our bottom line. We won't be here anymore. And so I would work with the sales team and really these, these business owners and these executives, they'd say, Sean, just, we want you to teach our sales team to sell to their clients the way that you sold to us. Mm -hmm. so, all right. And so I, I had to then deconstruct, well, all the systems that I've put into place to sell, how do I then transfer those onto a different sales team in a different industry with a different culture and a different makeup and a mindset? And so that's really how I ended up in the field of sales. And I realized that salespeople are a lot more like folks in the military than just about any other role inside of an organization. Um, oh, really? The people that are farthest away from the military are HR. I can tell you that without a doubt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is a valuable function. You know, they have to be in their feelings. They have to make sure everybody's taken care of and feels included. And that's wonderful. Organizations need that. Uh, but the salespeople are the ones that are out there in the field every day. They're on the front lines, literally, uh, with their customers, with their prospects. Uh, they're the folks that need to prove value every single day, be mission focused. So I find I connect with them uh, culturally, spiritually, emotionally, a lot better than a lot of other roles. 
And so what bulletproof selling is about is in taking the processes that the military uses to stay bulletproof on the battlefield uh, to learn from what happens so that even though we can't literally stop bullets from coming through the air, we can be in a different place than the bullet is going to be because we've learned mm. not to be there, right? We've learned don't step on that wire because it's probably hooked up to something you don't want to trigger. Salespeople, we find, uh, usually have to get smacked in the face a bunch of times before they realize don't do that again. And that means a lot of lost sales. So what we try to teach yeah. them how to do right. is learn sooner, implement faster, and that's how they can become bulletproof and how they sell. Wow. That makes me so Jeff is in sales and I love that he's always talked about the military and I'm and and I listen a lot to the calls that he has throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And I so the personalities that are in those sales um, industries and I look at it and I'm like, you're right. It's the they're the ones that are out there fighting the fight, the combat. Yeah. They're taking the fire <laughs> and yeah, have to show the, the results yeah. for it at the end of it. That's right. So, yeah, yeah. that's great. Well, as we uh, as we finish up here, I'd like all of our streakers to know. First of all, Sean, thank you so much for your service. Yes, thank you. At, as it, you know, in the military and everything else, we appreciate that. And thank you so much for sharing your insights and spending just a little bit of time with us. We have really enjoyed it. And streakers, just so you know, Sean was named one of the top twenty public speakers in the world by Toastmasters International. And he has hundreds of articles and everything else. A fantastic, dynamic individual. If you watch on you, if you watch our YouTube channel or watching it with us, you'll see that with him here. But also, if you want to bring Sean on to any of your organizations or associations, phenomenal individual who can speak um, on a plethora of subjects and really help you to understand what systems are. Sean, if if people do want to bring you out or whatever, what's the best way to contact you? Go ahead and get over to bulletproofselling.us. Uh, that's where all of our podcasts are archived. All of our sales systems are there. In case you're in sales, you'll, you'll find a rabbit hole that will help you improve dramatically uh, right there on bulletproofselling.us in addition to my phone number and lots of contact forms depending on what we can do for you. Okay, fantastic. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We have certainly enjoyed it. And Streakers, if you want to ask us any questions or get a little additional information on streaking or anything else, please email us. You can email me, Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-E-R-Y at streakingmastery.com or Jamie, J-A-M-I at streakingmastery.com. And you can also download the improved app where you can join communities like one of the things that uh, we're going to propose to Sean here is that he set up a bulletproof selling community on the streaking app so that you can go in and see exactly what you need to do for streaks in studying bulletproof sell selling and other things as well. The streaking app February 1st gets a major upgrade so you'll want to download it then. Until we talk again, keep streaking you.